Napoleon's official architects, Pessier and Fontaine, periodically had sent an illustrated newsletter of engravings to Tsar Alexander, showing the most recent public works commissioned by Napoleon. For after the coup d'etat that brought Napoleon to power, there was no end to his plans for making Paris into a capital worthy of imperial Rome. La Madeleine, begun as a church, was continued by Napoleon as a temple to glory. The architect Vignon intended it to be a replica of an antique Roman temple, incorporating statues and bas-reliefs and the use of rich materials. The purity and severity of Greek Doric was replaced by Corinthian splendor to commemorate ancient Rome, as was befitting an emperor who took as his ancestors the emperors Trajan and Alexander. Some of the most extravagant monuments since the fall of the Roman Empire were built by Napoleon as symbols of his dominion, and many are still tourist attractions in Paris today. Percier and Fontaine were also responsible for much of the replanning of Paris. They made a triumphal east-west route across the city. Another Roman touch was the long, arcaded street, La Rue de Rivoli. They prepared designs for linking the Tuileries Gardens with the Louvre, and even started on the interior of the museum itself, where their inventive details can still be admired today. The newly constituted Louvre Museum became Napoleon's domain. He commissioned France's finest artists to glorify his deeds, and the most celebrated of all was Jacques-Louis David. Disappointed with the aftermath of the revolution, David had sworn never to trust in men again, only in ideas, yet he was fascinated by Napoleon and quickly succumbed to his spell. When he first met the young general and first consul of France, he said, oh, my friends, what a beautiful head he has. It is pure, it is great, it is as beautiful as the antique. Yes, Bonaparte is my hero. Decades before the revolution, the encyclopedist Diderot had suggested the Louvre be used for the public display of the royal collections. Afterwards, in 1793, it opened as the Muséum Central des Arts, then came the brief but dazzling era of the Musée Napoléon, filled with the state treasures and the loot of his campaigns. It was here that David presented his newly finished canvas, the Sabine Women. It tells of the reconciliation between two warring tribes, the Romans and the Sabines, effected by a central allegorical female figure. Art historian Eva Burkhardt explains the remarkable device used by David to show this veiled plea for national reconciliation among the feuding factions of post-revolutionary France. This mirror is not here by accident. During my research on the painter David in Paris, I had discovered that it was actually a part of the original exhibition that David organized to show his painting, The Sabine Women. The exhibition took place in this very museum. The function of the mirror was twofold. First of all, it was to draw the visitor's attention to the central and most important part of the painting, the women. The oval shape of the mirror echoed the circular arrangement of the women painted by David. Secondly, it was to control the way the painting was looked at. David wanted that the people not only look at the painting, but actually participate almost physically in it. The visitors saw themselves reflected in the mirror, side by side, the actors painted by David. David had problems finding female models for his painting. The rumor has it that the famous society women of the period offered to pose for the painter. At the opening of the exhibition, they arrived dressed in the Sabine costumes, and they actually kept them throughout the evening when they went to the theater so that all of Paris would know that they were the ones who posed for David. But David didn't mean his female figures to be portraits. He wanted them to represent a political ideal seeing themselves in the mirror reflection, just as I can see myself now. The visitors to the exhibition were invited by David to rally to the Republican cause that these women represented.
Not only David, but also his pupils, Gros and Ingres, truly believed Napoleon was the only one capable of leading France out of the impasse of the revolution without sacrificing its principles. They joined in the glorification of Napoleonic images. Their art became a vehicle for propaganda centered on the cult of the emperor's achievement, virtues, and personality. Here, David painted the victorious Bonaparte on a magnificent rearing horse crossing the Alps. If the truth be known, he was riding a common mule. Another famous image of the Bonaparte cult shows Napoleon walking fearlessly into the plague house at Jaffa in the Holy Land, unafraid of contagion because of his almost divine power to heal. His first officer, a mere mortal, holds a cloth to his face to shield himself from the plague, revolted by the stench. Less ethereal, more practical, Arab and French medical officers are desperately trying to provide medical aid to the plague victims. Bonaparte's great deeds during his life as a soldier would continue to be recorded and represented throughout his reign. It has been said that modern propaganda was Napoleon's invention. Now first painter of the empire, David was given his most important commission, a monumental work called Le Sacre, the coronation. His early sketches show Napoleon audaciously crowning himself the final canvas portrays Napoleon crowning Josephine. David painted himself sketching the scene. Everyone had to be recognizably portrayed, including the members of the church and the Pope sitting quietly and unhappily as he watches Josephine kneel before the emperor who holds the crown in his upraised arms. Napoleon's sisters were not only jealous of Josephine, but also of Josephine's daughter from a former marriage whose child was rumored to be Napoleon's. Even Napoleon's mother, who in fact refused to attend the ceremony, was duly painted in. All the stars of the empire were gathered. The coronation was as much the triumph of Josephine as it was of Napoleon. For though she would never present Napoleon with an heir, she was the love of his life and wanted the world to know it. Ingres' own infatuation with the emperor prompted him to paint the official portrait of Napoleon in imperial robes.